Then, then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hachia, which is before Jeshimon? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having with him 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search for David in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul camped in the hill of Hachilah, which is before Jeshimon, beside the road, and David was staying in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies, and he knew that Saul was definitely coming. David then arose and came to the place where Saul had camped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, son of Saul, lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army, and Saul was laying, lying in the circle of the camp, and the people were camped around him. Then David said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zariah, Joab's brother, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping inside the circle of the camp with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the people were lying around him. Then Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now therefore, please let me strike him with the spear to the ground with one stroke, and I will not strike him the second time. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? David also said, As the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him or his day will come that he dies or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but now please take the spear that is at his head and the jug of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water from beside Saul's head and they went away, but no one saw or knew it nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because of a sound sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the mountain at a distance with a large area between them. David called to the people and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? Then Abner replied, Who are you that calls to the king? So David said to Abner, Are you not a man? And who was like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your lord the king? For one of the people came to destroy the king, your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, all of you must surely die, because you did not guard your lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and the jug of water that was at his head. Then Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord the king. He also said, Why then is my lord pursuing his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore please let my lord the king listen to the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is men, cursed are they before the Lord, for they have driven me out today, so that I would have no attachment with the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. Now then, do not let my blood fall to the ground away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to search for a single flea just as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not harm you again because my life was precious in your sight this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have committed a serious error. David replied, Behold the spear of the king. Now let one of the young men come over and take it. 
The Lord will repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I refuse to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Now, behold, as your life was highly valued in my sight this day, so may my life be highly val valued in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me from all distress. Then Saul said to David, Blessed are you, my son David. You will both accomplish much and surely prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Thank you, thank you. I hear that last week you had a longer passage of Scripture than this one. Uh, yeah, uh, I also hear that last week was pretty good. So uh, we will dive into this passage of Scripture after we pray, after I make one brief announcement. Uh, remember to add this event to your calendars, October 17th, 2020 from 4 to 7 p.m. We are having a crazy cool concert here on our grounds. Part of that concert will be a forum uh, led by a missionary, uh, Brad Sturm. Uh, he's a pretty cool guy. Uh, a forum centered on missions and the idea of missions and the importance of missions. So I encourage our whole congregation um, RSVP for that forum. There is no cost for this event. And if you RSVP for the forum and come to the forum, you get some cool free stuff. So <laughs> please come to that. It will be great. Uh, with this event, we are selling some t-shirts. So be sure and sign up. There's a form at the back here. Just put your name, uh, your, the sizes that you need back there. And then uh, once you've paid, we'll be able to place orders for those t-shirts. They have the Church at Sunsights logo on the back. And on the front, they say, I'm not a superhero. I just want to share the sun, uh, referring to Jesus Christ. The sun there spelled S-O-N. Um, so be sure and do that. Uh, this is going to be great. Several people in the community very excited about this event. And... Uh, I am too. I just can't hold it in. I have to talk about it. I can't hold it in. This is going to be cool. Uh, good music, good times, and good conversation about, about missions. It's also a missional event for our community where we will share the gospel. Uh, so, yeah, uh, add that to your calendars. Um, cool. And I'll announce this during the sermon. I have, like, illustrations during the sermon already prepared, colored, you know, flyers. Um, what is it? Sermon advertising during the sermon. We're going to start having paid advertisements. That's how we're going to start paying for things. No, uh, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, all right, <laughs> let's pray and we'll jump into this text of scripture. Lord, we love you. Lord, we come to uh, your table this morning as your disciples wanting to learn from your word words of eternal life Lord as we consider this part of your story we ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear minds to understand what you have to say so that we might know more about you through the reading of your word Lord help us not to read this in a way that is narcissistic or, or centers your story somehow on us, but, but help us by reading your story to know the author, you. And as your word is proclaimed this morning from this pulpit at this table, Lord, we ask that you turn our hearts more to you. Cause us to grow in our relationships with you. Give us hearts that yearn after you. We want to yearn for you, Lord. We ask that this morning you come and, and you wrestle us, wrestle our hearts, wrestle with our minds. And Lord, we, we want you to win. We want to be sanctified. We want to be conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, speak to us this morning. Speak to us as a church. Speak to our community. Speak to our world. Speak to us, Lord, as, 
as individuals living in relationship with you. Lord, we can't wait to see what you have for us this morning. Lord, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is a fairly long passage of Scripture, a fairly long part of, of the narrative here. Um, and we, we have already seen this pattern play out. We saw, we saw almost the same story in 1 Samuel 24 with just a couple of differences, and I'll point out those differences. So here is what I'm not going to do this morning. I'm not going to walk through verse by verse by verse because we'd probably be sitting here for like two or three hours, which, which I'm okay with. Um, <laughs> but there's also food waiting for us in the back room, you know. Uh, and, you know, to be a good Baptist, I'll, I'll, I'll make some key points here, especially since most of the explanation here, we've already been through this. We, we went through this in chapter 24. Uh, so I'll point out the pattern again, and, uh, and we'll point out a couple differences, and we'll think about our own sin, the struggle against sin, which is, again, what the text leads us to consider, right? Our struggle against sin. Um, we'll consider Christian liberty and what Christian liberty is. So we live in a society, and uh, this is a fairly new way to describe, like, enlightenment. The world has gone through several, you know, enlightenments according to the standards of of the world, um, we are in the midst of another one of these so-called enlightenments, at least according to the people leading the enlightenment. And they're saying, you know, get woke. And that's like, wake up, get woke. And that's like the hashtag woke. And this is what people are saying now. And it's, it's those people who are so trying to manipulate uh, government and manipulate the way that people are living and to say, hey, things need to be this way. And people who are, who are trying to uh, oppress others uh, and people who are suppressing um, the truth, suppressing people's opinion and suppressing free speech. And so I want to take some time this morning to address this. Uh, I, think, I think the text speaks to this. Um, but also since we are, we are approaching so quickly the vote 2020 and the election seasons there are a couple of things that we we cannot and should not do as a local church and as a 501 c3 i cannot endorse a candidate for office um and sure speak to one another privately endorse all you want but the church at sunsides cannot <laughs> endorse a candidate for president okay uh, not that we want to because i want i want to encourage you to vote your, your consciences Right? But since we're approaching the vote, and since I have the responsibility of shepherding this community of, of faith and speaking into our community as a whole, uh, it's something we need to address. And since the text speaks to that this morning, I'm going to take some time this morning and really just talk about the vote 2020. Uh, it really is amazing as we walk through it. We don't have to have like special, uh, all right, we're going to take a break from walking through Scripture, and we're going to go talk about this other thing, a topic that I come up with. Uh, because the scripture really speaks to all things. <laughs> As we walk through scripture, we, we get to all things. So we'll consider that, uh, especially when it comes to being, being woke <laughs> you know, in today's, today's society, in our time. I am amazed, absolutely amazed, that the world longs for enlightenment. Longs for enlightenment. Yearns for enlightenment. Desires enlightenment. And people are trying all sorts of things to achieve enlightenment. But however long the world has sought after enlightenment, yearned for enlightenment, the world has never been able to achieve enlightenment through human religion or through government or through regulation or through so-called expertism that we experience in, in our own day. The world has never been able to accomplish so-called enlightenment. We've seen the pattern of Saul in his life, his religion. It's, it's, been a, it's been an outward religion, a works-based, legalistic religion. And Saul has tried and tried. We remember talking about this, right? Those who have been here. Saul has tried and tried and tried and tried to keep God's law outwardly, religiously. 
according to his own works, by his own willpower, tried and tried to keep God's law. And the more he tries to keep God's law, the more he falls and the more he's unable to keep God's law. So uh, then Saul like offers these sacrifices and God comes in and through Samuel says, says, Saul, I do not delight in your sacrifice, <laughs> right? He, he doesn't even delight in that because Saul doesn't have this, what we call a relationship with the Lord, doesn't have the Holy Spirit, doesn't have a regenerate heart. And then we see David come around and, and David just, he like almost disregards God's law. <laughs> it's like, okay, here's the weird thing we see through 1 Samuel. And Dave, David is almost disregarding God's law. David is worshiping idols. David has a problem with with, with women, David you know, wants to seek revenge for himself. David is, is, a, is a sinner, <laughs> unrighteous, and he proves to be unrighteous. Yet God chooses David, even though David seems to disregard God's law at the beginning, right? God chooses David, says David is a man after my own heart. David is going to be king. David is going to be the one through whom I establish my throne within my creation. And for some reason, David seems to be free from the law, and Saul seems to be a slave to the law, a slave to the law of sin and death. And David, he just seems to be alive, even though he, he sins, right? There are a couple differences we see in this story, as opposed to chapter 24, where we saw Saul uh, chasing after David and David spare Saul's life, which is what we see in this story too. There are a couple differences here. First of all, in this story, David is not in a cave. In chapter 24, he was in a cave and he was hiding and he was cowering away. In this chapter, David is not in a cave. He is, he is on the hill of Hekilah, right? He is, he's out in the open. He's doing what God wants him to do. He is where God wants him to be here. The second difference we see is that... Uh, in chapter 24, Saul went into the cave to r relieve himself, right, to, to use the restroom. <laughs> and David was going to kill him, but instead cut off the edge of his robe to say, hey, look, I had the opportunity and I didn't do it. And he, he was convicted in his, in his heart not to do that. His, his conscience wouldn't allow him to kill Saul at that point. Here, David is actually going to Saul's encampment where Saul's army is. So we see a... a, a I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it's courage or if it's stupidity. I don't know, I don't know which one. Uh, I, I tend to, eh, you know, there's a fine line there. I, don't, no, I tend to think this is courage. I tend to think this is a little bit of boldness coming from David. I think we've seen where, where David has grown in his relationship with our Lord since chapter 24. Uh, the third difference we see here is that David, David from the beginning says, do not destroy Saul. Abishai says, hey, Look, we made it into the camp. Here we are. Let's take him out. And David from the start says no. Remember in chapter 24, David said, all right, he listened to his men. All right, let's take him out. And then his conscience got the better of him when he was about to do the deed, right? Here, we don't see any of that. David from the, from the outset says no, do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt, David here recognizes, oh, we read a little bit about this in Romans chapter 13 too, where the apostle Paul says, everyone, every single person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? Because the governing authorities were put in place by God. God works all things together. He is sovereign. The governing authorities were put in place by, by God. And so to lift a finger against those governing authorities, right, is... It's, it's not to honor God. It's to do the opposite of honor God and the authority that God has. And I, and I think there are probably some exceptions to that rule if we really want to think about it and draw out a, a theology of, of submission to government or subjugation to government, right? There are probably some exceptions to that rule, which I don't need to get into this morning. We just know that the, the normative means that God has for his people, the normative way God has for his people to live is, is in subjection to the government of our land to the governing authorities. Why? Because those authorities put in place there are an image of God's authority. All authority is from God. So that is God's representation of himself in his, in his world. He wins his glory through the worldly governments of our time. It's all about his glory and not about our getting whatever we want, right? So David says, David recognizes this. No, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed? Saul is in sin. 
Saul is oppressing his people, yet David still recognizes this. No, I will not touch the man that God has leading this nation right now. G God will bring justice. I won't touch him, right? Who can lift a hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? The fourth difference we see is that instead of taking a piece of Saul's cloak, the hem of his garment, David takes Saul's spear, his, his weapon of war, his weapon of oppression. David takes a spear and his jug of water, and they leave, and, and God is he's causing Saul's army to sleep. And David gets away with this stuff, and by the end of this story, <laughs> you know, David is... He's holding the spear and the jug, and Saul's man is calling out, and David's like, look, look how good of a job you're doing protecting your king. I got in there and got his spear and his jug, right? Putting the whole army to shame because, I mean, even if David would have followed Abishai's advice, Saul would have been dead. The army would have failed, which is an atrocity. If, if, if you are part of the king's army, like, the worst thing you could do is let the king perish in battle. And that would have been what happened. But David showed mercy, I think a very, a very godly mercy. We'll get down to verse 21. Now read verses 21 through 23, and we'll just kind of hone in right here. Saul said, after all this takes place, Saul said, I have sinned. Again, this outward sort of repentance. He, he did this in chapter 24 too. I, I have sinned. I've done wrong. Yet we see him here again, trying to kill David, pursuing David, trying to take him out, right? I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not harm you again. Uh, Saul said this in chapter 24, yet he's here trying to harm David, right? Or he was trying to harm David. I will not harm you again because my life was precious in your sight this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have committed a serious error. And David replied, Behold, the spear of the king. Now let one of the young men come over and take it. <laughs> take it if you can. <laughs> you know, come over and take it. The Lord will repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I refuse to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And I want to consider what's going on here in two parts. First of all, just slavery to sin. What does it mean to be enslaved by sin? And what does it mean to be, to be free in Christ? And that'll be the second thing we consider before I talk just a little bit about the vote 2020 and what, what it really means to be woke, to be enlightened. Slavery to sin. Saul... He's like on this roller coaster, right? And oppression against David, sin against God. And then he'll come down off the roller coaster and he'll realize the error of his ways. And he says, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I have sinned against the Lord. And then after this repentance, it's like back into sin. Back into sin because he's enslaved to it. He can't help himself. He's not, he's not able to stay away from that. And then he, he sins again. And oh, I recognize my sin, I broke God's law, and then it's repentance again. And like, oh, I sinned, please forgive me. My son David, come back to me, please forgive me. And throughout 1 Samuel, it's like this roller coaster. Sin, sin, and it's the same stuff, that, that same addiction, that same power trip, that same, how many of us feel like we're fighting and fighting and fighting against that same stupid sin, we can't overcome it. That's what we see with Saul. How many Christians worldwide talk about, yeah, I'm battling that sin. I'm going to fight against that. Yeah, I just, I can't overcome it. I cannot stop doing that. And it's really irking me. It's really annoying me. And it's driving me crazy that I can't overcome that by my, will, by my willpower. I can't kill that sin whatever it is. That's what Saul is going through here. This is the definition, and this is one thing that really irks me about human-centered religion. This human-centered religion, like Saul's religion, like Saul's whole lifestyle, encourages that battle. And it makes you feel like 
if you're not locked in this battle against sin, that somehow, you know, you're not, you're not pursuing, not pursuing Jesus or not pursuing God, not being religious enough. That, hey, and, unless I'm really struggling against a sin, then I, I must not be holy or, or pious because holy and pious people really try and overcome their sin. And if I don't feel like I'm in some kind of struggle against the wrong that I do, the imperfections of my life, must not be there. Look, this is more like Saul than like David. We're seeing the contrast here. That's what it means to be a slave to sin. Here's what it means to be a slave to sin and a slave to the law. By the way, this is how we all are starting out. This is how all of our religion is starting out. We really have to wake up to be enlightened to notice the error here. So God gave his law. He gave us this rule book, a massive rule book, okay? So many rules contained within those pages. And we see religious expectation and religion that gives you rules, how to be pious, how to be holy, how to achieve the the middle way, how to get to nirvana, how to self-actualize, whatever terminology we want to put there. How to get on God's good side basically is is the message there. And, And if somebody doesn't believe that there is a God, take the atheist, then the religious viewpoint is, oh, here's how you can benefit humanity the most. And it's still this works based religiosity, this legalism, and there's still this law. So we picture the law like a, like a circle around us. And we spend our lives looking at that law. No matter which worldview we, we start in, we begin in, we, we see this boundary. And it's like, okay, if I am going to be a good person, I need to stay within this boundary. And we're focused on the boundary. This is the mind of the flesh. This is the natural mind. This is how we begin in religion, right? This is how we, we begin in life. A toddler is born, and what? Parents give them rules. <laughs> and they give them rules through their childhood, and rules seem to add up on, on these children through their childhood, right? And then a, a good parent, then after giving those rules, will say, okay, here is why, why I have given you these rules. They will explain the rules like God does through his scriptures, right? Here's why I have given you these rules. Uh, and by the time you, you are an adult, a good parent's goal is to no longer have to make rules for their children, to set them free from the rules of the household because they, they, they teach their children how to be wise, how to practice discernment, how to make good decisions in life, right? We hope that's the end result because of <laughs> somebody is 30 years old, still living at home, and their parents are still having to make them all these rules. There's, there's probably an issue there, Right? The same is true in our relationship with God. God gives us all of these rules starting out. He tells us why He gives us these rules. And by the time we are mature in Christ, it's, our focus is no longer on the rules because through His Scriptures, God teaches us how to be wise and how to practice discernment. He regenerates the hearts of His people. He turns them in a different direction, gives them a new nature that is able to think and and reason well, and he writes the law upon their hearts. That's what all that means, right? Just like what we see in a household when parents are raising their children. Here's the problem with this boundary, right? And we can think about this in in terms of the, the Ten Commandments, right? Have you kept all Ten Commandments? We we know well enough to say. No, we haven't, right? There are some people who don't know well enough. No, I haven't really lied. No, I haven't really stolen anything, and I haven't murdered anybody. I think I'm good, right? I, I really try and be a good enough person. Here's the problem. Commandment numero uno. The first one says what? What's the first of the Ten Commandments? Yeah, that's... That's how it's worded in the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. Have no other gods before me. None. What do we do as soon as we, by keeping a set of rules, try and make ourselves righteous or be righteous according to the law or whatever standard is presented before us, as soon as we try to make ourselves righteous, we are putting ourselves in the place of God. Ah, okay. Why? Because God is the only righteous one. 
Because through the law, God is revealing himself as righteous and as holy, the only just one and the one who justifies his people. If we, through the law, are trying to justify ourselves to be good enough, we are placing ourselves in God's place. That's having a God before the Lord our God. Any legalistic approach to the law is it's blasphemy. This is what Saul is doing, and it's this vicious cycle, right? Because we try and obey the law, we try and be, we try and be really, really good, we try and accomplish righteousness, and all that does is prove how unrighteous we are because we, we presume to be in the place of God, the place of righteousness. That's not an easy message. and That's not an easy realization. It is literally impossible for people to keep the whole degree of the law. That's why God gave us the law, to show us how unrighteous we were, to show us that we can't be Him. We can't be righteous. We can't be we can't be holy like he is holy. So God says, be holy like I am holy, knowing that that statement alone is going to hand us over to sin because we can't. We are not God. That This is the vicious cycle that Saul is trapped in. That's what it means to be a slave to sin. That No matter how hard we try to, to, to get out of sin, to kill our sin, we only reveal how sinful we are in doing that and we fall and we have to repent, try hard enough again and then we fall again, we have to repent and try hard enough again and then we fall and try hard enough again and then we have to repent. Do you see the vicious cycle Saul is trapped in? Y'all, that is slavery to sin. We have this boundary and we are born under the law. We, we are looking toward the boundary of the law. That's, that's the natural direction we look. This is the natural mind. And we say, oh my, how overwhelming is this? But that's the thing we look at. And from a human perspective, the only thing we know when it comes to religion is, I have to keep the law. That's the only thing I can see. I have to keep the law. I have to do good enough. And no matter which religion, no matter which worldview we hold to, it's all the same. The scripture speaks into that. There's the boundary. I don't want to step over it or, or I want to justify myself to, to make sure other people know that, I, yeah, I'm, in with, I'm within some kind of moral boundary. This is slavery to the law. It's exhausting. It's burdensome. It's a, it's a, it's a heavy yoke to, bear, to yoke ourselves with, with sin in this way and to, to struggle against sin in this way. That's what we see from Saul. Then we see, then we see David, who's like, all free. <laughs> it's like, what's the difference here between Saul and David? If David isn't focused on the, on the law. And he's obviously not focused on the law, right? And he's not burning himself, killing himself, trying to keep the law. Instead, from, from the first moment we meet David in 1 Samuel, what, or rather, who is he focused on? God. He's not trying to be righteous. He's not trying to be good enough. He's not trying to be one worthy of God's choosing. He's, for, somehow he's free from that. Somehow he's, he's not yoked with, with sin in that way and, and sin is not enslaving him. There's, there's some kind of enlightenment there that, that a, a lo- allows David to live freely. To honor God and to point people toward God and to recognize God's righteousness and just to, to trust God to cover him even when he sins. I want that kind of freedom. Man, do you want that kind of freedom? I, I do. To not have to worry about every step that I take. All right, am I in the will of God? <laughs> am, I, am I sinning here? Am I overstepping my boundaries? Because sometimes it's hard to tell. And then to make up a bunch of rules is what the Pharisees did, right? To make up a bunch of rules outside the rules just to keep ourselves from approaching that, that boundary, that circle we, we see. I want the kind of freedom that David has here. In fact, No. I, I need that kind of freedom. I, I need that. Because human religion, it's, 
It doesn't get there, and it's burdensome, and I fall anyway, and because I fall anyway, and I'm trying to meet this standard, I'm, I'm condemned and I'm self-condemning over and over again, condemning myself, condemning myself, and condemning myself because I keep falling into sin, the sin that I am struggling with. And, and churches encourage that kind of struggle? Say, yes, by your willpower, kill your sin, focus on the law, focus on the rules, and more and more just become, by your willpower, more and more obedient to Christ. Y'all, that is a message exactly opposite of the Bible's message. That's Saul's religion, not David's lifestyle. Now remember, we look into a narrative like this, and this is descriptive. So I want to prove to you from more exact texts what I am saying here about the law and about freedom in Christ. I want to prove it to you. Can I prove it to you this morning? Romans chapter 8. I love the New Testament. You know, there are people who go both ways, right? You know, all we need is the Torah. All we need is the Old Testament. And then there are people who say, no, all we need is the New Testament. We need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Without the Old Testament, the New Testament has no foundation. Without the New Testament, we can't understand the Old Testament as fully because these apostles, and Paul, he's, he's a Jew of Jews. He agreed theologically with the Pharisees because he, he was a Pharisee, right? He identified with that theological camp, not, not with their practices after he came to Christ. He didn't identify with their practices, but certainly with their theology. Guys, theologically, the Pharisees had it going on. Not practically, but theologically, man, they had it going on. And Paul, he's a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And the book of Romans, is, it's Paul's broad commentary on the Old Testament. He says, all right, let me explain to you what's going on through the Old Testament. So anytime we like, find it difficult to understand what God's trying to tell us in the Old Testament, return to the book of Romans. And here, Paul explains what's, what's going on here. Why is Saul so so enslaved while David is so free. Paul explains to us what's going on. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, remember there's seven chapters of argumentation before Paul gets here. Read those seven chapters. I won't read all of them for us this morning, right? There's a context here. Therefore, there is now no none. None at all. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? All people fell short of the glory of God. No one could keep the law, but God redeemed his people in Jesus Christ. If we are in Christ, if our faith is in Jesus Christ, no matter our sin, no matter how we transgress God's law, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has what? Set you free from the law of sin and death. Free. Set you free. This is liberty. This is Christian liberty. This is good news. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. The law could not bring you into righteousness because you were unable to keep it, right? What the law could not do, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. That's a substitutionary atonement. Jesus Christ on the cross atoned for our sin, our transgression against God's law. So no matter our sin, if we are in Christ, there is no condemnation whatsoever. In Christ, God condemned sin in the flesh. Christ is the one who took on the wrath of God that was due us, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And there, what does it mean to walk according to the flesh as opposed to living according to the Spirit? Living according to the, the flesh doesn't mean they're sinning. And living according to the Spirit doesn't mean by our willpower being perfectly obedient. Paul is getting at something else. He, he has just opposed that sort of doctrine, that sort of legalism. So we can't misconstrue that verse to mean legalistic living, to mean complete and utter obedience to God's law by our willpower. No, to live according to the flesh is to be concerned about legalism, to be concerned about being good enough. The eyes of the flesh, we are born seeing what? The boundary. But to, to live in the flesh is to be focused on the actions of the flesh 
being good enough by our outward actions. And to live according to the Spirit, seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, not our own. Right? To be clothed in His righteousness. To exalt Him. To glorify Him. To honor Him. Not ourselves through some sort of works-based righteousness. So the whole passage is getting at that concept. Let me give you an illustration here. We'll continue our illustration. Uh, children, this was going to be the illustration during our story time. So this is for you, all right? And, and for me and for everyone else. So we have this circle. That's the law. That's the boundary. Those are the standards, the expectations of worldly religion, worldly worldviews, right? And the middle of this circle that we're referring to as the law, right at the center of this circle is Jesus Christ, the God-man. In fact, we could say the whole Godhead is right here in the center. The law was given to reveal how holy God is, to reveal his righteousness. So he is at the center. And we are somewhere in between Christ and his law. When we are born, we are born into the flesh. Not born of the spirit yet, We are born into the flesh, and our eyes are focused on the law. This works-based righteousness trying to be good enough. And we approach the law, and we condemn ourselves. We are are condemned and self-condemning because we can't keep that. We can't stay within these boundaries no matter how hard we we try. We can't be righteous, and we can't be holy, and we certainly can't, if, if we can't even stay on the border, right, of this circle, we certainly can't be in the place of Jesus Christ, which is what perfect adherence to the law would be. It would be at the center of the circle. Christ is the only one who can be there. He's the only one who is worthy. So we are condemned and self-condemning. That's what the flesh gets us. That's the way of the flesh. But instead, here Paul writes about living, walking according to the Spirit, which is something very different. It's to, it's to focus our eyes in a different direction. Instead of focusing on the boundary, we're turning around and we're focusing on on Jesus. And if we're walking toward Jesus, it's just natural that we're walking away from the boundary. We're having, having the law written on our hearts. And there's great freedom in that because I'm no longer worried about, okay, am I in the will of God? Okay, am I sinning? Okay, am I overstepping my bounds? Okay, did I, did I go too far with this one? Instead, we're just, we see Jesus. And we see His righteousness and we're part of His kingdom. And we are running toward Him, discerning as best we can, you know, in this life to, to honor Jesus and the things that we do. That's the law of life. The law of sin and death is to be looking the other way, focused on the boundary. This is what we mean when we say Christian liberty. It's why every Sunday I don't come in here and <laughs> hark on you about all of the stuff you're doing wrong. I can't believe you did this. <laughs> you know? that's, that's why we don't do that. That's why we don't have to do that. And it's why we don't have to, in our, in our gathering together, be condemning of people because we are focused on Christ. We're not, we're not focused on the law. Now, that doesn't mean the law is unimportant. It doesn't mean the law doesn't serve a purpose. It certainly does. But when we don't have to check off all the things we're obeying, there is a freedom there and a liberty there. The sort of liberty David experiences and Saul does not. Right? Verse 5 here in Romans chapter 8. For those who are according to the flesh, here it is, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Why? Because they're looking at Jesus For the mind is set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Freedom. Peace. Peace of mind. I don't have to worry about that because Jesus is my salvation, not the law, right? Because because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Why? Our backs are turned on him if we're... (laughs) We're focused on the law. Remember that illustration. Our backs are turned on him if we're just focused on the law and trying to be good enough. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. Get this. For it is not even able to do so. Not even able to subject itself to the law of God. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you, referring to believers, you are not in the flesh but in the spirit. 
if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Something very serious here. If we are living in a legalistic way, focused on the law, the standard, being good enough, no matter which worldview we are in, if that's the way we are living, we have eyes of the flesh, we are living a lifestyle of the flesh, we are in religion of the flesh, we do not belong to Jesus. I want you to get this, okay? Because this is important. How do you know whether or not you have eternal life, whether or not you are in Christ, right? You know you are in Christ if you are free from this law of sin and death. We know we are in Christ if we are no longer living legalistically and if we're no longer pointing our finger at others or ourselves and saying, all right, fight that sin, overcome that sin, you must do this, this is how you please God, and if you don't do it, you are, you are not holy, my friend, right? That, no. That's evidence that we don't belong to Jesus. That's evidence that our Christianity is false. We experience false conversion. We must see this in the book of Romans, Right? Christian faith is not, it's a, it's a faith of liberty, not of legalism. The sort of liberty David experienced and Saul didn't. Saul was enslaved to his sin. David was woke. Saul was benighted. That would be the opposite of woke. <laughs> benighted. If, who, who knew that word? <laughs> right? Yeah. No, it's complete opposites. And people have the same sort of religion that Saul had in They call it Christianity, or they call it Islam, or they call it Hinduism, or they they give it any sort of name. They don't call it anything. They're atheists, so they don't believe in religion. They're just trying to be good enough, right? Legalism of the world is damning for us. That's how we are born. Our souls must be resurrected. Christ must regenerate our hearts, and He is the one who turns us to focus on Him rather than on the law as a boundary, right? Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Don't go back to your works-based way of doing things. Bear the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the flesh, right? Behold, I, Paul, Say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. They're subjecting yourself to the law. That's what that means. It doesn't mean literally every person who is circumcised as a baby is damned. No. Paul there is talking about subjecting oneself to the law as a means of gaining righteousness. It doesn't work. We are condemned and self-condemning if we do that. It is of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law, which no one can do. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Not a righteousness of our own, Christ's. God's righteousness, not by works of the law, but by by grace through faith, His imputed righteousness to us. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love, specifically God's love, through which He gives us faith, and faith by which we are sanctified, having the law written on our on our hearts. God, do you get the freedom here? This amazing freedom we have in Jesus Christ. No longer being yoked under the slavery of the law. No longer having to meet the expectations of worldly religion. Just just loving Christ, being transformed by Him. By the renewing of our minds, not by people telling us what to do and what not to do. No, by the renewing of our minds. And Jesus gives us different desires as He regenerates our hearts and the Holy Spirit comes in to to guide us. The Christian faith is not a set of rules. It never was. Biblical Judaism is not a set of rules. It never was. 
It's about God's glory. God saving a people for himself, not to exalt those people, but to glorify himself. He is building his church. That's why Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, freedom, liberty from the law. I will free you from the law of sin and death. I will, I will put you under the law of life, which Christ fulfilled on the cross on Calvary. And he died for you and, and for me, for, for all the elect of God. I bet you're wondering at this point, how in the world does this speak into the 2020 election season? I'm so glad you asked. And this is <laughs> I'm so glad I asked for you. <laughs> we get this. If the Christian faith is about liberty, what is the foundation of this nation we live in? What was the key concept the nation was founded upon? We have a statue in the East dedicated to this. Liberty. And it's not this like libertarian sort of liberty, right? Our founding fathers believed in law, but law only so far as they enabled the freedom of the people, the freedoms of the people. Laws that stand against oppression and suppression in order to enable the maximum degree of people for the, for the greatest number of people. Our founding fathers built our nation upon John Locke's political philosophy. And he, he based his in, entire political philosophy, get this, on Genesis chapter 1. I have both treatises of government from John Locke at home if you would like to borrow them and read them. I encourage you to get them as American citizens. Please get them. They are very good. The philosophy there is, is very good. It was based on this idea that man and woman were created in God's image. All people, every race wrapped up there in the creation, both sexes wrapped up there in the creation, created in the image of God. In the image of God, he created them. That's, that's the key verse for John, John Locke's political philosophy. And from this, he begins to argue about how no person has the right to rule over another person. Because God, God is the authority and God is the sovereign. From this philosophy, this democratic republic we live in was formed. And there's a reason it's a democratic republic and not just a democracy, right? Because in a, in a democracy, the majority just rules. And there's oppression and there's suppression there. Because whatever popular idea there is at the time, whatever the, the greatest number of people buy into, whatever philosophy there, that's the philosophy that rules the day in, in a mere democracy. So we also have a republic, right? This is a lot like Reformed church ecclesiology. We have our elders who are affirmed by the church, but then the elders have the responsibility to lead the church together and to hold one another accountable. It's a democratic republic, <laughs> which is kind of crazy to think about, Right? Like, this is one of the most biblical forms of government that we can possibly find, but it has been so, so, so corrupted, either giving power to a few or power to what is popular. And there's this constant tension between the democratic side of this, the liberal side of this, right, and then and the republic side of this, the conservative side of this, this constant tension tension has gotten so bad in our day that the liberal side of this, the, the democratic side of this, right, it, it's not even liberal anymore. What does it mean for somebody to be liberal? Do, do we know what the, what the term liberal means, what it means for someone to be liberal? Someone once asked me, are you a liberal? Yes and no was my answer. And they were like, what do you mean? Because <laughs> they're thinking like hyper, like political liberal, right? No, liberal means generous with information and freedom. 
by liberalism today is exactly the opposite of that. Oppression, suppression of truth. Even now, it's where the, the biggest social media platform in the world is just flat out, has it written in its policy now, suppress what we don't agree with. Suppress what makes people mad. In this country, we have the, the freedom to lie if we want, to present fake news if we want. We hope that our people are informed enough to know the difference. On the conservative side of things, the republic, right? Things aren't any better on either side. It's almost like this, this power ethic. And there is this, we want to control the things that are happening. So we don't want to ignore the problems on either side of the spectrum, right? That this year is not an easy year to vote. It's not, an, it's not an easy year to decide what's important. Because there are problems all over the place. And corruption, y'all, all over the place. Things that we need to think about. Things that we need to be informed about. But if we take a Christian look at things, a biblical look at things, we take this, this Christian liberty, idea of liberty, the liberty that God created us for, we just choose to vote according to the law of life, not according to the law of sin and, and death. I, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know. I want you to think about this. I want to think about this myself. We don't want to suppress the truth and we don't want to support anyone else who wants to suppress the truth. In fact, we don't want to suppress any information because we want people to have it all. We want people to know how to think for themselves. And the expertism of our day, right? We see this with the whole COVID-19 season thing. It's a weird thing going on, right? Where the experts come down and they say, all right, wear a mask. All right, stay six feet apart from one another. All right, don't gather in groups of more than... This is not the biblical way or the American way, by the way. We really believed in liberty in this nation and in our households and our churches. We get away from this expertism. We'd give people information, accurate information, and say, okay, count the costs, make a decision for yourself. But that's not what we see. Many of you have already decided who you're going to vote for. I am still thinking. And I will think right up until the election. <laughs> but get this, get this. Whoever, whoever we vote for, I just imagine the comments that are gonna come as a result of that. <laughs> whoever we vote for, and each person must vote according to his or her conscience, right? Whoever we vote for, we vote according to the law of life, freedom, liberty. That's, that's the only way we can vote in a nation that allows us to vote. And we vow whoever wins the election, they will be our president. And we will subject, you know, submit to that authority so long as we don't have to break God's law to do so, so, so long as we don't have to go against God to do so. Right? We will submit. And if you vote incorrectly, there is grace. Grace at the foot of the cross because guess what? God has already ordained who will serve as our next president. And that's the truth of it. We don't have to worry. Oh, what if I made this great mistake? No, you don't have power to overrule God, all right? You don't have to worry about it. freedom, liberty. And everything that we do isn't God so good this is worth celebrating 